The San Diego Musculoskeletal Project presents part three of our knee injection video series, Knee Aspiration and Injection Techniques. This video is intended to be viewed after the first two parts of our knee injection series. Part one covered indications, risks, and supplies for knee injections, and part two reviewed knee injection anatomical approach options. Now in part three, we will discuss the aspiration and injection techniques for three of the anatomical approaches. In this video, we'll walk through the anatomical landmarks and injection techniques for these three positions, the seated anterolateral approach, the supine medial midpatellar approach, and the supine lateral suprapatellar approach. We'll start with the seated knee approaches. If you choose the seated position, you have a choice between the anteromedial and anterolateral approaches. However, since the anterior fat pad tends to be thicker on the medial side, I usually will do an anterolateral approach if I'm using the seated position. Start by finding the anatomical landmarks for the anterolateral knee approach. The landmarks are identified by finding the lateral soft spot of the knee bounded in clockwise order by the inferior patella, the patellar tendon, the tibial plateau, and the femoral condyle. These anatomical landmarks are the same for the anteromedial approach, just found on the medial side. Seen on a patient, identify by palpation the same landmarks seen on the model. In clockwise order, the inferior patella, the patellar tendon, the tibial plateau, and the femoral condyle. Once you have the anatomical landmarks, Mark the center of the soft spot, being careful not to go too close to the femoral condyle, which tends to curve further inferior than your palpable edge. Now, the seated anterolateral knee injection technique. The supply list was reviewed in part one of the knee injection series. However, there is one simplification you can make when doing a seated injection. Since you're less likely to get a synovial flashback, you can prepare a single syringe of anesthetic and cortisone and do the procedure in one step. This is another reason the injection is faster than a supine approach. First, use your anatomical landmarks to find and mark the soft spot of the injection site. Once your site is marked, then prep with an alcohol pad and then chlorhexidine or iodine times three. Whether you use chlorhexidine or iodine, allow the site to dry completely for optimal antiseptic effect. Once the prepped site is dry, you can apply ethyl chloride for topical cooling. The needle is then inserted in a posterior direction parallel to the floor, aiming towards the intercondylar notch. As mentioned in part two, because of the anterior fat pad, expect to use the full needle length to maximize your odds of reaching the knee joint. Once the needle is in place, aspirate and then inject the cortisone solution. Remember that synovial flashback is less likely in this position, unless the effusion is fairly large. You should feel minimal resistance, and the solution should flow very easily. If you do have resistance, consider repositioning your needle before proceeding. Once the injection is done, withdraw the needle, cap your needle and dispose of your sharps, and apply gauze and a band-aid. For the supine approach, as mentioned in part two of our video series, you have many options. You can choose the mid-patellar approach, either medial or lateral, or the suprapatellar approach, either medial or lateral. And any of these approaches can be done in full extension or in slight flexion. Let's start with the medial mid-patellar approach. The main landmark, of course, is the patella and you can usually feel a small gap between the medial patella and the underlying femoral condyle. Seen from the side, you can appreciate the small gap at the mid-patellar point, which lets you access the joint space. The first step is to palpate and find that small gap between the patella and femur. Once you find a good position, mark it with a pen. As with all our injections, cleanse with alcohol, then chlorhexidine or iodine times three. Allow the site to dry fully. I'll use this first supine video to describe the two syringe, one needle technique, also called a lidocaine flashback technique, that we teach students and residents to increase their chances of confirming the joint space before injection. We prepare two separate syringes, one with lidocaine and the other with Kenalog and Marcaine. 
Details and volumes are given in part one of our knee injection video series. Back now to the video, we have ethyl chloride for topical cooling. Then we take the lidocaine only syringe. Inject the lidocaine subcutaneously in the line of the knee injection. You already should have marked the small gap between the patella and the femur, and now you'll aim the needle towards the intercondylar notch. You may feel a small amount of resistance at the capsule, and then feel the needle pop through into the joint. Once you think you are in the joint, inject 1 cc of the lidocaine and immediately aspirate to see if flashback is obtained. As you can see here, no flashback is visible, since this is a relatively dry knee. However, if you feel you are in the joint, try applying suprapatellar pressure, then do the lidocaine injection and aspiration again. By compressing the suprapatellar bursa, the lidocaine doesn't have as large a space to spread to, and the flashback with aspiration is easier to see. Once the joint space is confirmed, transfer the cortisone solution syringe to the needle hub and inject. Be very careful not to touch the hub of the needle or the cortisone syringe, and do not change the depth of the needle where you've already confirmed the joint space. Again, minimal resistance should be felt if your needle is in the joint space. Once you're done, clear your sharp safely, then gauze and a Band-Aid. Now that we've seen a mid-patellar approach, we'll walk through a suprapatellar approach. As mentioned in part two, the mid-patellar approach can be more difficult and painful compared to a suprapatellar approach because the mid-patellar gap is smaller than the suprapatellar space. For a lateral injection, whether you choose a mid or suprapatellar approach, the knee is most mobile at full extension. You can push the medial patella gently in a lateral position to create a little lateral overhang under which your needle can enter fairly easily into the knee joint. For a lateral suprapatellar injection, find the point where the superior patella curves into the lateral patella and mark a soft spot lateral to the edge of the quad tendon. Once you find the suprapatellar soft spot, mark the site with a pen. You can see in this patient that the suprapatellar space has a more obvious soft spot than the mid-patellar site. Once you've marked your spot, the technique is the same as a medial mid-patellar injection. Again, we prep with alcohol and then chlorhexidine, or iodine times three. Allow the site to dry fully. Then ethyl chloride for topical cooling. Start with a syringe with 5 cc of lidocaine 1% alone. To decrease the pain of the injection, inject 1 cc of the lidocaine subcutaneously. For the suprapatellar approach, you are aiming under the quad tendon, and you may need to adjust the angle of your needle to get deep enough. Once you reach the joint space, you should see your synovial flashback. If it's a dry knee, try injecting lidocaine first and then aspirating. Aspirate and fill as many syringes as possible. The size of your aspiration syringes is a personal preference. When we use a 21 or 22 gauge needle, we usually use a 6 or 12 cc syringe to aspirate. Using larger 20 cc syringes is difficult through the small bore needle. If you plan to drain a large effusion, you might want to use an 18 gauge needle, which will allow you to aspirate the effusion more efficiently with larger syringes. Once the aspiration flow begins to slow down, suprapatellar pressure can help drain the effusion more completely. After finishing the aspiration, switch to your injection solution, whether cortisone or hyaluronic acid, and inject into the knee joint. Finally, withdraw and dispose of your sharp, then gauze and a Band-Aid. After every knee injection, Review expectations and aftercare instructions with your patient. Remind the patient that the short-term lidocaine and bupivacaine may give relief from 4 to 12 hours.
But cortisone can take up to two to three days and hyaluronic acid can take up to one to two weeks before their effects are felt. Thus, the patient may feel some soreness from the injection before the medication takes effect. They can use ice, rest, or NSAIDs for the temporary discomfort from the injection. After three to five days, patients can advance activity as tolerated. Warn them to return to medical attention if they notice any redness, warmth, swelling, increased pain, or any other sign of infection in their injected knee. As an ongoing goal, Remind your patients to continue working on quadriceps strengthening, low impact exercise, and weight loss. On average, the cortisone effect is up to four weeks, and hyaluronic acid can sometimes last up to five to six months. If the injections were effective, a cortisone injection can be repeated in three months, and the hyaluronic acid injection can be repeated after six months. The next set of slides are included as a reference for you with a summary of the supplies and procedure steps needed for the seated knee injections and the supine knee injections. You can pause the video and print screenshots of these slides for future use in clinic. An example of a procedure note is also included for your reference. Include the doses of medication injected as well as your approach for your future reference. Finally, procedure ICD-9 codes for knee arthritis diagnosis and injection are included as a reference. This concludes Part 3 of our three-part knee injection series. I hope you found the information helpful. This video is brought to you by the San Diego Musculoskeletal Project. For more of our videos, please see the SDMSK Project YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.